Hello and welcome back to another Teardown Tuesday. I'm Jack in the training department. And today, we have something I've wanted to tear down for quite a long time. And this part was actually sent in courtesy of a field technician. So thanks Stephen, I appreciate you sending this in. And this is a linear actuator. So what this does is we have two main wiring harnesses. We have this wiring harness which runs back into the motor body. And we have this harness which runs down into this end piece. And when we energize this, the motor runs and this part of the device gets longer. It'll extend out. When we run it in the other direction, it gets shorter. It comes back in. So it's linear motion, only moves in one direction. It extends and gets short again. And it's an actuator, hence the name. When we look at the data plate on this, we see it's 24 volt DC. And there's a lot of other information on here, but it's not entirely clear what it means. Right? It says it has no thermal protection. That one's pretty clear. But a lot of this type, you know, the other data on here, it doesn't, doesn't really tell us what it does. We do see one here for duty. Looks like intermittent duty, so it's designed to move at an interval with a cool down in between. But it is not designed to run back and forth continuously. And then this end piece is called an encoder. So what's happening here is as this device runs, this encoder is plugged back into the control system, and it's reporting back to the control system how far the device moved. And, and typically they report in a, a sequence of pulses. It'll tell the control how many pulses it picked up. So I'll be really interested to see what this looks like inside. So let's start by opening up this encoder. So you can see here it's pretty simple as far as how it's put together. This is going to be a magnet, like a rare earth magnet. And there's a, a little bit of magnetic force there, a little bit of attraction. And as it turns it's being picked up by sensors in this board, probably like a, a Hall effect sensor, that are reporting back how many times they sense the magnetic field rotate. So it's going to report those pulses back to the control as this rotates. Now to get this further apart, it might be a trick to get that magnet off without breaking it, but we'll see. It should slide off this shaft, but it, it might just split apart. Yep. And, and you can see there, once it was pressed on, there was really no good way to get it back off again. But you saw it jump out and, and grab hold of my screwdriver blade there. There we go. So underneath the rare earth magnet are a couple more fasteners. And a small washer. And let's take a moment here and just pop this circuit board out before we move on. Alright, so you can see we feed in four wires. And we have very few connections here. Just a few probably Hall effect sensors and some semiconductors to control that signal. So it's a really straightforward system. When the magnet is in position it would rotate past these sensors and they would just trip open and closed to report back to the control that the magnet had spun past them. So there's the back of our motor. Now the really interesting part in here is going to be down inside this drive mechanism. 
But before we do that, let's see if we can actually get this to move. So I'm going to cut this plug and I'm going to hook it up to a 12 volt battery that I just happen to have here. Alright, so we've got the wires cut and stripped. Got my battery just out of frame here. Let's see what happens. Ah, see how it's spinning? The end of this is not supposed to spin when it's installed. It would be retained. But you can see that the motor was driving the shaft outward as it, as it turned the motor. The gear drive down here was extending the shaft out. So let's try going the other way with it. Oh. Let's try going the other way with it. And there you can see it draw back in. Now we're only energizing it with 12 volt DC, but it moved at a pretty good rate. So at 24 volt, this thing would have a, a pretty good speed on the actuator. So now, Let's get into the actuator mechanism itself. So on this side, there's some stickers, some labeling, and they don't want you to get in here and really open this up. They're trying to tell you there's no user serviceable parts, but we're not really trying to service it at this point. So let's peel that back and see what we got here. All right, looks like it's Allen fasteners. I'm not sure if there's any springs or anything in here, so we'll go kind of slow opening this up. But it doesn't look like it's pushing out at all. Pretty long retaining screws, so they're probably going all the way through into the motor housing. Yep, and the motor just came loose here, so let's go ahead and pull that out. Alright, so this is kind of what I expected based on the way this works. This is called a worm gear, and as this motor rotates, the worm gear is engaged into another gear inside the housing, but there's a direction change happening. So let's I'd like to open this motor up too. Maybe we'll go that direction first. But I want to get my battery back up here and hook that motor up so you can see what that worm drive looks like when it's turning. So I'll get this car battery back up here. And we'll energize. Oh, got some grease coming off. So you kind of see how that works at this point. Probably should have done that before I energized it, but... Alright. So it's a really nicely machined gear, but in order to get the motor apart, we're going to have to get that gear off of the motor shaft so that we can pull everything apart in here. And if you look down inside, there's a pin driven down in there. Looks like a roll pin or a, a spring pin. So, be right back here. I'm going to go pound that up. Alright, so you can see I've started to get that roll pin out. But I just wanted to pause for a second and let you see how exactly that pin sits in there. So that pin is made larger than the hole that it's pressed into. And when you pound it in, it, it shrinks down, but it's made out of a spring steel that pushes back to its original position. It tries to push back. So it expands and it keeps tension on itself. So there's the pin.
And now here's our worm gear. So we'll set that aside over here, come back to it later. So the motor itself has some seals on it here at the end. And it looks like it's got two bolts holding it together. So let's get a socket on that here. So those are long and they're fine threads. There's a lot of turns to get those out, but you can see when we hold them up against the outside of the motor that they run all the way down the inside. So now that we've got those out, the end on this side, the shaft, the drive side is loose, but I would like to get this back open because that's where our power goes in. So let's give it a quick tap here and see if we can get it to come apart. So we've come apart on the front. There's our seal and a little slinger there to keep any debris from getting down inside. You can see our bearing is housed down inside of a seal as well. So it's really, it's really doing a lot to try and keep that clean. And now let's see if we can get the other end cap to pop off here. Looks like it's actually been punched back at the back here, so it's probably going to be tight getting it out. There, it's starting to go. So at this point, it's the force of the magnets that's really holding us together. And there we've overcome the magnets, so now we've got our stator out, and our brush assembly is right here on the back of the motor. So we'll get into that in a second. Take a look first down inside. These are permanent magnets. They're a rare earth magnet. And when we talk about failures, one of the ways that these can fail is if these magnets get cracked. So if anything were to happen to the outside casing, like say shipping damage or uh, an impact that distorted it, these magnets would crack and then we would lose the magnetic field we need that makes our motor operate. So now, looking at the back of the motor here, you can see that it's, it's a brushed DC motor. And what that means is there are two small carbon composite devices here. They're back in the back, they're inside these little sleeves, and they're under spring tension. And those are called brushes. Now back when motors were first invented, that would have actually been a brush. It would have been a carbon filament brush that laid against the edge of the motor. Now we use these smaller composite devices because they last longer. When this motor is energized, the brushes are transferring that voltage into the windings, which are these wires woven all through the core of the stator. As the motor rotates, you can see that there are gaps. You can see the gaps in between the different phases of wiring there on the windings. And the brushes come into contact with different parts of the stator. So this surface that the brushes ride against is called a commutator or a COM, C-O-M-M. -M. And as the motor's running, there will be arcing that will happen in that area of the motor. Over time, the brushes wear down and the arcing increases and this shiny surface back here begins to pit and wear. And eventually, the motor will not be able to operate anymore because there will be so much wear on this comm surface. Now when we look closely here, you can start to see a little bit of a groove, and that groove is the beginning of that wear. Now that groove is not severe, and there's not a lot of other pitting, but as time goes on that groove will get deeper and deeper, and eventually the motor will just stop working. So that is one of the failure methods for this style motor. These brushes also wear down, and you'll get dust and grit back in here, which just begins to accelerate that wear even further. So as this all wears out back here, the end result's still the same. This motor will eventually wear out, not because of bearings or anything else, but just because the brushes and the comm surface have worn down. 
Now if this were a particularly unique motor, or if it was hard to find or expensive to replace, we could take it to a machine shop, a motor rebuilding shop, and they could put this in a lathe and turn this surface down. Once you've done that and installed new brushes, the motor will operate again. So when someone talks about having a motor rebuilt, that's one of the things that gets done, particularly in a brushed motor. So let's pop apart one of these brush springs. And once we get the brush spring out, we should be able to take the brush itself out of its retainer. Let's spin that around a little bit. You can see that spring is pushing on the back of the brush. And then we release it, spring comes off. So now we can work the brush up and out of the retainer. And you can see the material the brush is made out of and how it's worn to fit precisely against that motor shaft, against that comm surface. You can see it's got a, an arc to it where it fits firmly up against. The tighter the fit, the better it will make contact. And you, you can see from this one, it has not been in service very long because it still has the manufacturing marks across most of the brush. It hasn't really worn in yet. It's really only worn in one little corner. But taking a look at the way this motor's built, it looks like these are soldered in to the end of the wiring, so they are not made to be serviced. So in this particular case, the, the assembly is a service part. You would not get a brush kit for this motor and do it as a field service. So let's set that aside. So as I put this episode together, it became obvious that it was going to be too long for a single episode, and instead of doing one really long episode, it would be better suited to do two shorter episodes. So we're going to take a break here. We're going to finish talking about the motor, we're going to go into a little more detail on that, then we'll pause. Next week, come back and we'll tear down the actuator, and you can see inside the actuator and see how that works. It's just as interesting as the motor, just in a different way. So to finish up the conversation with the motor, when we have a brushed DC motor, what we're actually doing here is we're making two magnetic fields interact with each other. So when we energize a given segment of wire, a winding, it creates a magnetic field. That magnetic field interacts with the permanent magnet and it creates pull. So we pull the stator around. So this whole assembly is rotating and as it rotates, different windings energize. Each time a new winding energizes, it creates more pull. It creates a new magnetic field that's pulling into the permanent magnets in the can. This, this piece is a can. And that's how we create motion. As this surface wears out, we lose that ability to energize the winding, and the motor gets weak, and eventually it just doesn't work anymore. We have too much resistance between the brush and the winding for the motor to energize the winding. So that's where we'll stop for this week. Come back next week, we'll tear apart the rest of the motion control, the linear actuator, and uh, all of the associated parts that go with it. It's really interesting. Hi folks, my name is Jack Kell and I'm a senior technical trainer for SmartCare. The video you've just watched is part of a larger series of technical training videos we make available to our technicians at SmartCare. If you found this interesting and you'd like to see more, please subscribe. I'll be releasing a new component teardown video every Tuesday in 2022. If you're already a SmartCare technician and you have a part that you'd like to see me tear down, please reach out to me internally for shipping instructions. If you're not a SmartCare technician, but you or someone you know would like to learn more about a career as a service technician specializing in commercial restaurant equipment, please check out our open positions at www.smartcaresolutions.com forward slash careers. Thanks for watching.